Hello, I'm Nigel Griffiths, who work at IBM in this Hardware Management Console 8 crash course. We got to part 5, HMC Management. Hi, well, welcome back. I assume you were looking at the uh, Creator Virtual Machine video uh, a moment ago. And uh, here's the actual LPAR uh, VM100 that we created there. I did a minimum install and put it onto the network once it booted up. That took me uh, 7 minutes. By minimum, I mean that I skipped X Windows, very rarely use that these days, and I skipped all those device drivers that it loves to install. This one has um, a virtual network and it has virtual SCSI. The VO server knows that that's connected to a shared storage pool, but the uh, the virtual machine doesn't, and it's got virtual optical. So life's really simple, we can keep AX really nice and small, and it installs a bit quicker. But enough of that now, we're going to look at HMC management, and this is all down in here in HMC management. So we're going to click through the user interface in here to see all the things we can do with our HMC. Now remember a HMC is a locked down appliance. You can't get to the underlying Linux to fiddle about with the uh, the operating system and all the uh, regular Linux commands. We can only do things that are on this interface all the commands and the commands are almost identical to what we can actually do here. Maybe a couple of extra ones if you want to fiddle about on the command line. If we hover over this then we can see some details about the HMC. We can see serial numbers and things. This is a CR8 in here. There's a CR9 out now. I call this the 840 version of the HMC and that matches the, if you're on a Power 8 machine, the 840 uh, system firmware. Other people call it 8840 and some people even say the V8R840 all the way to the time. Let's call it the 840. We can also see down here that we got some fixes applied to this particular release. So further on down we have review console events, if you're interested in auditing what's going on on your HMC then that's so useful. Uh, it can take quite a while to open if it's uh, very busy. Uh, the next one, shutting down or restart. Um, do make sure the restart is clicked. Um, if you just click on the, the shutdown and hit OK, it will shut down the HMC and it will stay down. I'm 50 miles away from the computer room, it's a real drag uh, turning up to press the button to get the HMC running again. If you do it on the command line, you have to type in the minus R option, otherwise it goes down and stays down. Okay, schedule operations, I'll come back to later. Uh, format a USB drive. Oh, come on, we can do that the other, in a laptop or something, can't we? Okay, uh, we back up critical uh, data. This is for recovering a HMC if the complete machine fails. Um, and you can see on the screen in here, we could back it up to an internal disk. Uh, we could put it onto a remote uh, system. Um, or back it up to a remote site. So I tend to use uh, like an FTP server. And do you want to include the, the performance and monitoring data? If you're using that, you can put that as well. That will increase the size, of course. It will then ask you for the details of your remote server. So the remote server then obviously um, is looking for NFS and the uh, remote site. Let's go back and do that again. The remote site, perhaps that's the and there's the FTP. Probably use the secure FTP out of choice. Very simple to operate unless to go wrong. Okay, um, and then if you recover your HMC, uh, maybe install it off the uh, the base DVD again, then uh, restore, of course, will bring back that data. It will then remember everything about itself. Um, you have to put it onto the network, of course, to get the data back on, unless you're using some sort of media. The save upgrade data, this is used when you're upgrading between the uh, HMC versions. Um, that actually saves it to the disk. Some of the uh, the large updates completely overwrite the HMC software, and then it will pick up the data back out of that uh, partition on the disk. Uh, change network settings, well, you did something in here similar when you did the initial setup. Um, on the network side, you can see here, this is my IP address. Uh, for me to log in and this is the IP address that's the private network um, down the back of the machines to the service processor. All right, click on that one you can see it's got a, a range in here of addresses um, 64,000 addresses seems a little excessive as 64 machines is the maximum and um, we've got firewall settings in here we tend to activate um, all the possible different uh, ports that it's using for different servers and things, we tend to activate them all. If you have uh, very strict security uh, requirements, then you can uh, not 
do some of these. S and MP, for example, well, it's pretty low level, and maybe you don't want to bother with those. Um, out here, we got the naming service for DNS and uh, the routing for our gateway. Nothing too scary in there. If you do change that, you do tend to have to reboot. Uh, testing network connectivity. Oh, this is really exciting. This gives you the ability to do a ping. So we can do a ping in here. It does actually collect a whole load of information that you probably can't get to the commands that do that um, if you log in for the uh, command line interface. So some of these things you probably recognize as netstat outputs and things like that. Um, and this might just save you actually having to go off and do that, those sort of commands to work out if there's a, a problem here. Air yeah, routing, for example. You can see how it's been set up. In here we've got network topology, and it's going to go off and uh, discover that. Okay, we'll let that run, and we'll come back to that later. We have a quick tip of the day, um, and you can hit the next one. Some of these are quite useful to you picking up some skills of what's in here. And if you click this on, then every time you log in, it will give you a tip of the day. Um, you either love that or hate that. I personally hate it, so I switch it off. Next in here is view licenses. <laughs> you don't, well, I suppose you can go in there if you want. Um, it's a bit of a record-breaking uh, license. In fact, it all comes out as a one-line uh, HTML file, um, and uh, that line is uh, 30, 30 megabytes in size. And I actually managed to get an editor to, to take that in, and it said that there's 1,500,000 words. It's a world record. I reckon that if you can read uh, 100 words a minute, that would take you 32 days to read that license. So good luck. The next couple of settings down in here are to change the way the user um, environment uh, looks like. Um, I use absolutely bog standard, never been in here changing these. Um, we can click on this one, the performance monitoring settings, that can be quite good. And we get this, um, so this is where it's collecting the data, and uh, we can then quickly go down these, selecting them all on before we... So that later on we can come and collect the data and see the graphs on the screen. So that was a quick dodge. That's particularly good. Oh, I could have clicked the uh, all on, I suppose. In here we have the time and date, so we can change that. It's not rocket science. This is the guided setup. Again, this is the one that you do only once. Don't go through it a second time. You have to type in all your details all over again. Now, earlier on we looked at this view network topology. And it eventually came back, it took quite a while, um, and this is looking at the, the network from the HMC's point of view. So it says some nodes fell. I think this is because um, it has four Ethernet connections on a HMC, two of which are not actually connected, so it says no link, that's fair enough. And then it says uh, ETH1 here is uh, full duplex, that's good, and it's running at one gigabit, that's good, just to make sure that that's actually happening. And then it's got all the LPARs in here. And, um, oh, I should have said that, yeah, the first one here, this is running on my um, systems administration uh, network, the way I actually talk to it and get this user interface up. Then it goes through all the virtual machines in here, so you can see VM95 has 95 at the end, just as we expect, and it tells you the machine uh, type on the model number and the serial number on the back in here. So some useful information in here. It actually says that it's... Um, in this machine, it is uh, Virtual Adapter 7, and uh, it goes through all the all the different things in here. If you look at a, a VO server, then I can go and find out the address being used there. If we scan further down here, this is F0, so this is the private uh, network running to the service processors. Again, we can see that's running at full speed, that's good. Here's the actual address of the... Uh, HMC and of course it's given itself a, a dot one address then it has the machines in here and the service processor the FSP in here this is the actual address that the service processor has been allocated via DHCP so that can be quite useful information and then we have page after page of that we also have in here that um, the LPARs aren't on that network in my configuration that could be different elsewhere and it, and it says it hasn't got an IP address onto the private LAN which is uh, as I completely expected 
Um, so although it takes up quite a long time to come up, it's actually quite a lot of useful information to see how the HMC is connected. I'll close that now. Let's carry on. Scroll down, we have a change user password. This is my password I can change in here. This is how I create uh, new users. And I just noticed in here, oops, slightly too small, because of my font size is up a bit. Um, if I want to create a new user, let's add my uh, colleague, uh, user ID, uh, Gareth, and this is Gareth password. Um, I just have to go and tell him what there is uh, when he logs in later on. Um, I could put an expiry date so that uh, it would time out. We can do LDAP and Kerberos as well. Um, we don't tend to do that in our small crash and burn environment. Um, all resources in here so that all the machines he can have access to. And yeah, just hidden slightly below here, this is the super admin uh, that gets all the privileges that you actually want in here. We can have other uh, task rows. We'll look at how to set those up in a second. Um, unfortunately, you have to go to his user properties in here if we wanted to allow him to log in um, over the network. Um, and so we have to nip there and back. We'll OK that. And we come back. And we can OK that and create a new user. OK, yep, Gaz here. And um, yep, we have to go up in here to um, actually exit. We could do um, copy, for example, if a whole load of users are exactly the same, just change their uh, IDs and things. OK, let's exit out of that. Next one down in here are these uh, resource roles. And so we can create um, new roles in our uh, resources in here. So we can uh, put an add in. And so we can allow this new role, um, admin 42 or something, and we can specify particular machines or particular um, LPARs that are in here. So we could allow them to have uh, add this node and add this node so that they can log in and manage these two particular LPARs and uh, nothing else. So then we can allow a person to access these particular resources and none of the others, um, perhaps to limit the damage or, or to control what's going on. We could uh, select on all these machines, perhaps all the database servers, for example, so then we'd have an administrator that's allowed to start and stop those servers, but none, other, none of the arrest. I'll cancel out of that, as I don't really want that. In here we have users and tasks. This is the, what's running at the moment. And whoa, that's too big to put on the screen because there's a lot of things on here. Um, this is my PowerVC user kicking in. Here's me, my current session. And I'm in the Manage Users and Tasks. And you see this is my current uh, one here. It's a, oh, it actually says up here, this is my session. This isn't actually true. They need to fix this sometime. PowerVC is coming over uh, the um, REST API. So this should say REST API in here. Um, but if you've got old users sticking around, then uh, you can get rid of them. If uh, we, you know, PowerVC was shut down or something, I could go in here and hit uh, log off and shut these uh, sessions down. If I was uh, somebody was logged in here and um, I wanted to disconnect them so that they could reconnect on a different terminal or something or a different uh, yeah, laptop, then uh, we could use the disconnect to do the same sort of thing in here. And if we've got something, an uh, actual uh, window that's uh, locked up or something, then we could go in here and terminate it. Uh, not very clean way of stopping things. And uh, yeah, you just notice there that every now and again it updates the, this list of uh, processes that are running. Can get a bit frustrating if you just clicked a few and didn't get to the log off button, and it redisplays the whole lot. Down in here we have more uh, more security things. I can't say I play in here at all. Managing security and certificates. Uh, these are switches in here. That is just a simple thing whether you want to enable those by default when you first um, install a HMC. These are all switched off. We want them on, so we have to go around clicking all of these uh, to enable uh, remote execution, remote terminals, and uh, remote operation. Uh, language locale is fairly obvious. Oh, the welcome text. We could have something in here. And so when you log in, it'll actually give you this message up on the screen. Uh, probably not bother with that. 
Um, we can also have um, replication data. Uh, this is the HMCs uh, find out about each other, and so when you add um, particular things into one of the HMCs, you'll find it appearing on the other ones. The, this is a fairly complicated area because you can set it up as sort of one master HMC, and it flushes changes to the others. We have to remember to go onto that HMC to um, put the updates in, um, or you can have mutual updating, so any one of the HMCs, uh, if you add a particular features then it will get spread to the other ones probably another movie in its own right these last two down the bottom we have installation resources you can use the HMC to do the installing of um, AIX and we can do the same sort of thing with installing your VAO servers now if you're not using your own NIM server then um, this is a way perhaps in a smaller environment you've only got a handful of machines and you don't know anything about NIM then you can use your HMC as a, a NIM server and in here we can add and we've got uh, AIX in here and some copies of uh, SLES and the VO server um, has some, you know, I've noticed this didn't work before it may be something to do with this particular browser, but if we blindly click it, we can see we have AX7, for example, and we can either create a local resource in here, or we could define a resource on a NIM server, and then ask the HMC to kick off the NIM server to do the uh, install. Um, again, we don't tend to do this. We, we're very happy running uh, NIM servers to install our um, copies of AIX and the VO servers uh, from scratch. So in, in here, um, the VO server, a uh, similar sort of thing, yeah, it's going to import the uh, image um, and you can get it from various places including the actual DVD in the front of the uh, HMC and you'll give it a you know, VO server 224 or something for the version number and then you can push those out. And in fact, when you create a, a VO server um, logical partition, um, when you start it up it says do you want to do an install and it assumes that you've got a image uh, set up in here so that you can do it um, this is actually you know the HMC is running uh, Linux so this is known as NIMOL so it's network installation manager on Linux is being used okay we've run out of things on my list in here uh, that's it for this movie if you enjoyed part 5 why not click on the liked icon below the thumbs up in part 6 we'll be looking at upgrading the HMC itself and upgrading the firmware on the power machines.